Thanks to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. You know, especially during these hot summers that only seem to be getting hotter and hotter, maybe you don't want to go out to a restaurant and sometimes you don't have time to do grocery shopping. HelloFresh is here to make life easier though. You can choose from a humongous variety of meal plans from all different cultures like burgers, exotic chicken bowls, pizzas, trust me, there's a lot there. And you can easily customize your weekly plans if you're feeling different or you want to get something that you'll know you'll like. And it's all delivered directly to your doorstep so you save money on going out. I don't know, unless you want to go out and risk a heat stroke. Each box comes complete with easy to follow recipes so that prep and cooking take no time at all and everything's all wrapped up nice and neat, saving all waste and portioned just right to make sure you're using everything in the box or maybe you want a little extra to have leftovers the next day. And as someone who's been keen on maintaining a stable weight thanks to DDP Yoga, it's important that I'm putting healthy stuff in my mouth. I made the one pan pork carnitas tacos recently. Tacos never ask for much prep and cook time, an easy lunch or dinner that's packed in just the right amount of flavor, zest, and calories. I do love cooking and HelloFresh thankfully keeps my hands busy. And they can keep your hands busy too with their amazing deal. Go to HelloFresh.com and use the code SCMJ16 for 16 free meals across 7 boxes and 3 free gifts. Again, that's HelloFresh.com code SCMJ16 for 16 free meals and 3 gifts. These wouldn't be possible without your continued love and support of this channel, so as always, thank you very much for tuning in. Now let's continue on with the show. Let's keep things moving along now with the second of the PS2 Ratchet and Clank titles, Ratchet and Clank Going Commando. And this will be a recurring thing for future games, innuendos galore. Ratchet and Clank Going Commando, up your arsenal, quest for booty, size matters, full frontal assault. A crack in time's name was originally Clock Blockers, which was later rejected. Ooh, okay, Clock Blockers was too much, but up your ass was just fine, then fuck out of here. They don't all have uh, provocative titles, and I think most of the innuendos windows were dropped overseas, but I like to think it's only because they couldn't think of a clever pun that also worked within the game's themes. I respect the attempt at keeping the gag alive at least, and I personally can't wait for Ratchet and Clank cocked and loaded. Five months before the release of the original Ratchet and Clank, Going Commando was already greenlit for development given the positive response that the first game received from playtesters. That game would also be a critical and financial hit for general consumers, so feeling further justified with this decision likely, Sony was definitely trying to keep the momentum going with this new generation generation of consoles. Fans would not be waiting long for the second game as Going Commando would hit store shelves just a year later for the 2003 holiday season. After the defeat of Drek, Ratchet and Clank were celebrated as heroes and got to live a good life, for a little bit anyway, as the two are now spending their time twiddling their thumbs, waiting for their next calling. And after their latest interview, they're suddenly called to the Bogon Galaxy thanks to Amber Crombie Fizzwidget, the CEO of Megacore, essentially that galaxy's gadgetron. Fizzwidget requests Ratchet and Clank's assistance in retrieving an experiment they were working on that was recently stolen by this mysterious thief. As a signing bonus, I guess, they'd get a new apartment and Ratchet will receive special training to make him a professional badass, even learning some dancing and origami. So just two weeks later, I'm assuming Megacore has the fucking hyperbolic time chamber for that's all it takes to make a capable soldier around here. Ratchet is primed and ready to seek out the missing experiment and confront that mysterious thief. Okay, that's the basis. The rest of the story is just kind of going through the motions. That's the best way I can put it, I think. Maybe I was a little naive thinking that Insomniac had a greater scope in mind because... Okay, so it doesn't take long to confront the thief, right? You quickly learn that, huh, maybe the thief isn't as menacing as they appear to be. You start to get the feeling that they're not that big of a threat. And then it's revealed that this thief is actually a woman named Angela Cross, former employee of Megacore, that actually wanted to keep the experiment away from the company as the creature can be duplicated to run amok across the galaxy, causing untold chaos if not handled properly. Okay, so she's not the actual bad guy, so what is it? Then we have these thugs for less goons, led by the thug leader that sporadically shows up, causing some problems for Ratchet on the occasion, but never enough to be more than an ass sore. It makes me wonder, oh, what's the bigger picture here? The first game made it very clear that Drek was the head honcho, the main antagonist. Here I am a few hours in, and I'm not sure where this is all going, and I don't feel that this mystery is like deliberately played up in this case. It feels like the story is treading water until we get to an obligatory conclusion. 
So then you manage to get the experiment back to Fizz Widget, and there's this recurring thread where you're not sure if Fizz Widget is really a bad guy or is just super incompetent. And this is on top of having to deal with the thief and then the thug leader. It's getting very muddled. Then it's revealed that Fizz Widget is actually Captain Quark in disguise, something that, in my opinion, is not so subtly hidden. <laughs> this is bad. All right, just what the f is going on? Because throughout the game, Ratchet and Clank view these Captain Cork documentaries, detailing the rise and fall of the superhero, and you know they wouldn't be spending so much time on these if there wasn't some sort of payoff. And with Fizz Widget acting more and more antagonistic as the game proceeds, that right there I feel gives the whole thing away, and now you're just waiting for them to pull the trigger on it, which doesn't happen until the final 10 minutes of the game. And after that it ends. I was so caught off guard when the credits rolled, I was not expecting it to just suddenly end like that, I don't know. If Going Commando was, say, a three-act play, Quark being revealed as the mastermind should have been like the end of Act 2, with a whole other act dedicated to his schemes. I think that's my problem with Going Commando's story. It never feels like we're properly building to any sort of climax. It is treading water. It's an unfocused wild goose chase that's uh, littered with ads from Megacore, and you don't have ad blocker installed. As it is, he just kind of comes and goes with the wind and it ends with him getting testicular torture. I'm gonna give Going Commando this though, the humor is great, it's the best part of the game. As previously, there's a lot of characters you meet that supply the laughs, and overall I found this game to be funnier than the first. Fizz Widget drove me insane with his butchering of the English language that warped it incredibly fast, like even as a bit I found, oh my god, it's kinda hard to make out what this guy's even saying. But our entire galaxy is in a very precocious situation. I must humbly request your sustenance on a mission of dire urgitude, a mission of superfluous peril, a mission of unequivocal imperitude. Did that make any sense? But given who he really is, it makes sense. Quark would butcher the language just to piss Ratchet off, piss me off by extension, really helps sell the fact that Quark is a dude you just want to punch in the face. The thug leader was a fine character too. I love the fact that his thugs for less company, a band of hitmen and mercenaries, have pizza parties for good performance and practice good work ethics altogether like they're everyday workers. Outside of helping Megacore spread the proto-pet menace for profit, working for this dude doesn't look like it'd be the worst thing in the world. In sector one, two, three, four, five. If you're no good with numbers, find a buddy to help you. Lastly, the company picnic is this Sunday. Don't forget to bring your own juice this time. Hey! I saw that, Cletus! You just turned yourself a writer! Don't worry, the boss only yells because he loves us. So the first game, right, was no stranger to mocking capitalist ideals. Some of you in the comments were even quick to point out that the very existence of the paywalls in the first game were supplementing that very notion. Okay, fair enough, I can buy that for a dollar. Here though, they go fucking balls to the wall ham, mocking capitalism and consumerism. Let's get the goods on that experiment. What the? I think I see the problem. What? Now even the computers are charging us? That's it. This galaxy blows. With all these megacore ads and documentaries you watch as you progress through the story, I felt like I was watching a Robocop spinoff. Given the franchise's love of innuendos, Ratchet and Clank would unironically try and sell me a gun called the SUX-6000. But with Going Commando here, I feel the priority was put more into the yucks than making a uh, clear enough point A to point B story. I thought Angela Cross was gonna matter a little more in this adventure. From the beginning, it's clear that she's set up to be threatening, yet clumsy, but after her identity is revealed, her significance and screen time peter out so hard, so fast, her previous history as a Megacore employee has some payoff and ultimately what leads to the heroes coming out on top, but I think the logical thing to do would make her a playable character in some fashion. I feel a lot more could have been done with Angela, though it looks like she's here to stay going by the ending of the game, so uh, maybe next time. Like, and I want to point out, I didn't hate the story at all, but I do find it a step back from the first game, as I find it lacks focus. At the very least, Ratchet is less of a dick this time. Honestly, it's almost a complete rewrite if you ask me, because yeah, he's still a bit of a dry smartass, but he's given more heroic qualities, isn't nearly as selfish, and really goes out of his way to care for Clank in this game. Different voice actor too, and I immediately recognized the dude as soon as he spoke, it's James Arnold Taylor, who I know is Titus from Final Fantasy X, and no, I'm not going to play the Titus laughing clip because you sheep lack context and are easily misinformed. Thanks for stopping by, hit that like button and subscribe. From what I understand, he's going to remain Ratchet's voice actor for the rest of the series, and I think he does a great job, though I didn't mind Mikey Kelly's acting in the first game either, I thought he did a good job there too. Once again, the production values across the board are stellar, voice acting, animations, and environments, everything I complimented the first game for rings true here too. 
and I was shocked to see that this game supported widescreen in 2003, no less. I mean, that was the time widescreen TVs were making their rounds for general consumers, but it wouldn't be entirely commonplace until the mid 2000s, but it was a welcome surprise. When I'm recording PlayStation 2 games, the HDMI converter I use stretches the footage to fill the screen, and I've grown to really hate that over the past decade and a half. So seeing a widescreen option available makes that less of an eyesore for me and saves me or my editor in this case, time in fixing the aspect ratio for review purposes. Though just a quick tidbit, I don't think it's true widescreen. It just squishes the aspect ratio so it doesn't look too weird when the picture is stretched out on the TV. I also noticed a little more slowdown during my action packed romps, but again, I was expecting that and it didn't help in my case that I was keen on using the very explosive weapons for my playthrough. So, okay, didn't really think the plot was as good as it could have been. Going Commando, the video game, this is such a marked improvement over the last game. And let's keep in mind that I already thought the first game was a solid adventure, something that I think anyone could enjoy. Structurally, the game continues to follow the formula from last time. It may be a different galaxy, but you're still planning hopping across many different locales that present a different challenge outside of shooting shit until the cows come home, like air gliding, and later on where you can just straight up levitate for a few seconds in certain areas. This was really fun to do. I love the challenges this came with, one of them being very reminiscent of the jetpack levels of Crash 2. But this levitate thing controls much better for one thing, and secondly, the jetpack has numbed all sensation in my soul, and Ratchet and Clank couldn't hurt me even if it tried. But there's also plenty of puzzle solving scenarios too, like using the this crane to move objects and clear a pathway, you can maybe grab another robot and have them commit mutiny, or later on you can get this mind control device and really get them to cause some mutiny. They really ramped up the platforming for this one too and that is not at all a complaint, I love me a good platformer as you know going commando doing aces with this. Very linear yet streamlined design too, like there's a couple of snags I'll get into later, but I found no level in this game to be taxing just to travel in, recording sessions were breezing by and I didn't find myself getting exhausted. And I love it when sequels don't entirely neglect all the progression you made in the last game and pay respect to it, because Ratchet and Clank from the start have access to some equipment he had before, like the O2 mask for underwater breathing, the enhanced long jump and hovering abilities, and the underwater jet boosters for easy swimming. If you have a Ratchet and Clank save file in the same memory card, you can even unlock some of that game's weapons in this old Gadgetron shop. They're not very good compared to the stuff you get later, but having something like the Tesla Claw available early on did make the smaller threats much easier to manage. But going Commando's new arsenal of weapons, man, it fucking blows the previous game selection out of the park if you ask me, and some now even have a manual lock on. You gotta buy the upgrade for that first, yeah, and I hope in future games it's just embedded into the guns automatically, but this is a start. It really came in handy because now all my bullets were hitting the targets they're supposed to hit. This is great. I want to stress I did not get to test all the weapons available, at least not until post game where I had the extra balls to spare and I was curious, and all I can say is that I'm really glad I didn't invest in that lava gun, but I still had my fun with the decent chunk of weapons I did invest in, and I was able to find my comfort zone in no time at all. Hell, for me it started as early as the first few weapons you get, the lancer and the gravity bomb. As they were, one was like an improved blaster from the first game, and the gravity bomb was a more destructive bomb glove. The blitz gun, this game's shotgun, say less. Loved this weapon early on, great for crowd control. But then I saw that in this game, weapons evolve after you use them enough times, upgrading to much more powerful and destructive weapons. And my face when I learned about this was nothing short of orgasmic. Okay then, getting some RPG elements in my Ratchet and Clank, I love to see it. This incentivizes weapon use, even if at first it doesn't seem too handy, though that still wasn't enough to make me respect the lava gun. You still have to purchase new weapons and all that, and depending on your playstyle, some might be better than others, but that's the joy of experimentation, and having weapons level up only highlights the kind of fun you can have as long as you have a sense of curiosity. One weapon I'm glad that I stuck with was the Seeker gun. At first, I was content with it just being a long range option for early game progression, and the way it auto homed in on targets mean I didn't have to bother being too accurate with it. But once it upgraded to the HK-22 where it fired three rounds at once, it was my top pick for some of the larger goons and boss fights, like against the Mega Pete, who spends most of his fights circling the arena in midair like the prick he is. But I'm sure there are also other weapons ideal for this encounter, again, the beauty of experimentation, something I think the Ratchet and Clank series does well in highlighting so far from what I've played. But once I got the bolts to unlock the Bouncer and later the Plasma Coil, that was all she wrote. Those became my main weapons. And they weren't cheap. Both cost over 100,000 bolts from what I remember, which isn't too far from how much the Rhino cost in the first game. But Going Commando showers you in bolts from basic level progression and the different challenges offered to you in the game's battle arenas or hover bike races and the starship battles. Going Commando gives you so much opportunity to earn a ton of bolts if you just put a little time into it. And 
A lot of times I did just that, sometimes against my better judgment. The desert planet. You need to collect 10 of these purple crystals to repair your ship, but once I saw the size of the level map and also saw that there are more than 10 crystals to collect, I said to myself, okay, I am positive there's about 100 of these things, and I think collecting them will get me something other than a skill point. Like, this is too much work for it to just be an achievement, I thought. So I combed the whole fucking thing as soon as I could, which I would not recommend doing, by the way, until you get the mapper and charge boots later in the game. The mapper pinpointing the crystal's exact locations on the map with the charge boots allowing you to fast travel on the ground. I really should have waited for these looking back, but you know what? I'm not too ass hurt about that. Because once I did collect the last crystal and saw the payout I received when I delivered them, <laughs> straight into the bouncer it went and I felt so fucking invincible afterwards. It's such a good weapon that only gets better after you level it up or when you modify with the platinum bolts you collect. This game is equivalent of the gold bolts from last time. I find it funny that the basic currency of going commando are gold bolts and the platinum bolts, which is the same color as the basic currency from the first game, are considered rare here. If only Ratchet had the hindsight. Could have made a killing. When there was an opportunity to earn more bolts, I gladly spent the time to go after them because, well, I wanted more money, of course, but I also found the extra challenges fun and rewarding in their own way. The arena challenges were the best part of the game for me, gameplay-wise. Like, I did as many of these challenges as I possibly could as soon as they were available. They were a lot of fun to do. I figured it'd be the smart thing to do to have a money buffer for ammo, armor upgrades, and I figured the paywalls from last time would be back, and yeah, they sure are. Embrace yourselves, they're much larger than the first game. But considering this game gives you so many ways to earn bolts, these ended up not being a big deal at all. Leveling also applies to your health bar too. The more enemies you kill, the larger your maximum HP gets. That is seriously great, and by the second half of the game, you'll be glad you did this because some of these fuckers, even with these added armor upgrades you can purchase later, they still hit your ass like freight trains or in the Yetis from Planet Grelbin's case, hit like freight trains that also come in groups of five and six. I've heard horror stories about these creatures from friends before, and I can say that those stories were no jokes. These guys suck. Apparently, these enemies were so disliked by fans and Insomniac staff themselves that they made an in-house reward called the Snow Beast Award, given to the person who developed the worst thing about the game that they worked on. It's considered a badge of honor, so I have to wonder if anybody in Insomniac with future games deliberately made something horrible just to get this thing on their shelf. But since we're on the subject of things I didn't like, Going Commando didn't fix all my complaints I had before, and even introduce some new hiccups to get these out of the way really quick. The D-pad is still used as a second means of movement and not a dedicated hot swap for weapons, so you still gotta hold one button down and scroll through the wheel with the analog stick. Though I like that the game now momentarily freezes as you make your selection, so you don't have to worry about getting in a real-time tizzy when you're deciding your best course of action. This game went and made some tools context sensitive. When it's time to use them, you just hit the proper button to use it lickety split, like this game's electrolyzer and the infiltrator. And my compliments, this is the kind of change I wanted to see. It frees up inventory slots for other things. Things. But this was only done selectively. Items like the returning swing shot or the dynamo, which creates holographic platforms in specific areas, and the Therminator, essentially this game's hydro displacer, are still separate items that need to be equipped first before they could be used for their momentary purpose. In fact, if I were to compare, I found myself pausing the game and fiddling with the inventory more times in going commando than I did in the first game, given how often you needed to use these tools to progress through the game. So if you want my advice, dedicate four slots of your weapon wheel to tools and leave the rest for your weapons. You're still pausing a lot, but it's less of a hassle. I know it may seem strange that this is such an issue for me because when you get down to it, what is so different here than say, managing your inventory and equipment in a Zelda game? I think it has to do with the game's sense of flow, its pacing. Ratchet and Clank is far more adrenaline filled than the slower, methodical Zelda title, so I think in Zelda's case it's easier to absorb, where Ratchet and Clank, where I want to keep things moving, it can feel more intrusive. Although I do recall having similar inventory complaints for Link's Awakening DX and the Game Boy, so I guess even in Zelda's case it's case by case. <laughs> Now we're talking only mere seconds of time, but it adds up. It's basically the same complaint I had as last time. So again, I have to wonder how will future games tackle this if at all. The mini games you end up playing when using the Electrolyzer and Infiltrator are not the most exciting thing either. The Infiltrator game where you're basically playing connect the dots is just trial and error. You will solve it eventually just brute forcing it, so you know, it's a thing. I didn't really like the Electrolyzer game at all, and suddenly the mini games I played in Insomniac Spider-Man are beginning to make more sense to me. Until you get used to it, it feels overwhelming trying to keep track of all the incoming lines and making sure you switch the gates in time, otherwise you gotta start the whole thing over. I found it best to blur my eyes when looking at the screen because if I tried to focus on one light at a time, I would end up losing everything. So that's my advice for this. Blur your eyes, you'll look like an asshole, but you'll be an asshole who gets results.
The clank sections are back and are still pretty fun. It's about more of the same from before, but even a couple more bots introduced that put a spin on how you solve certain mechanics, like building bridges or smacking things with a hammer. I feel these were not utilized to their fullest potential though. One robot I think is used only once. This lifter robot? Uh, maybe they just didn't know what to do with that one, or maybe they fell under time restraints. I don't know. Maybe the game's challenge mode does more with these things. The kaiju sections are also back. More explosive and chaotic this go around too. I won't lie though, winning these felt like a crapshoot. You get bombarded so easily in these. Rockets, goons, your massive frame makes you an easy target. A part of me wished Clank had the same mobility as Ratchet while you're doing this shit because besides tanking hits, I don't know how the hell you're supposed to mitigate all the shit that's thrown at you at once. Damn, especially against stuff like the Thug Leader's Brigade. I did like how the best strategy against the UFOs was essentially Goomba stomping them. I felt like I really accomplished something figuring that one out for myself. A few times you'll also be doing these starship sections, similar to the space battles in the first game but on a larger scale. Still very Star Fox, but I didn't find these very fun. Your ship isn't very good early on without getting a few upgrades which you don't have access to until later on. You got your basic laser gun which is fine, and you have a stack of missiles that wipe out smaller ships in one strike once you get a clear lock on which takes a little too long without upgrades if you ask me. Your ship is also not equipped with the best defenses in the beginning. Outside of the shield you may or may not get from pickups scattered across the map, you can do a barrel roll, which I think is about it. And that itself means niddly dick when you're constantly getting hounded from behind. It's kind of a similar issue I have with the clank sections. You get swarmed with laser barrages very easily in some missions, and then you end up getting flustered, and then you find yourself smacking into some wall, which instantly kills you. The control is also a little too sensitive. It's not the worst thing to deal with in dogfights, but in other missions, like say the race against Ace Bunyan, where you have to meticulously fly through these rings and all that, not very good, and my eventual win didn't feel graceful at all. Now once I purchased like the faster lock on for missiles, these became a little more bearable, enough where I was able to comfortably complete some of the optional challenges for extra bolts, but I would still consider these the low point of going commando. Right besides this dickhead, the final encounter against the thug leader on planet Snivlak. I don't know who thought giving this asshole so much health was a good idea, but I hope they got a snow beast award for their troubles. It took me 15 fucking minutes to finish this guy. Fucking love bullet sponges, man. I used the turrets on the rooftops, a few points I used my other weapons, but this guy's health was just not. What is going on there? I legit wondered, am I doing something wrong? Is it supposed to take this long? When I made a post about him on my Twitter and seeing all you guys react negatively to the guy, it was then that I knew, oh no, this is just how this boss was designed. Although a few of you have also made me aware of the quick kill with the Sheepinator, so next time I'll be sure to do that instead. What a pain in the ass, I really hope this isn't a recurring thing. The actual final boss wasn't nearly as taxing, though looking back, this thing should have been the last boss because this giant fuzzy testicle with teeth was too easy by comparison. You got me. So yeah, this game's got a few snags and the story didn't really land for me, but my experience with going commando was still super great. God, that sounds so weird out of context. The weapons are better, the leveling system for them and your health was a great addition to combat that was already fun to start. The game has an excellent blend of action and honest to god platforming complete with a myriad of different challenges that control well and are never overbearing. The sheer selection of weapons gives you so many options to consider for the next obstacle. This game feels so rewarding to play, so rewarding to progress through, and knowing that there's an extra challenge mode, also acting as this title's new game plus, I know there's more to tackle for future revisits and you can bet your ass I'll be coming back to this one. This has become one of my favorite platformers on the PlayStation 2, granted I haven't played many of those to be fair, but given my past experiences with platformers across the board, Going Commando is a real winner, a high recommend from me. So okay, uh, will it get even better next time? We shall find out with Ratchet & Clank Up Your Arsenal, or Ratchet & Clank 3, as it's called in Europe, you fucking cowards. But as always, thank you all for watching, stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask if you decide to go outside, get vaccinated if it's possible, uh, give this video a like, hit subscribe, ring the bell, uh, bake at 350 degrees until golden brown, uh, poke with a fork to ensure-